I'm asked, from where does closer to truth come? From nothing, I say. Let me explain. I was a child, not yet 13, lying in bed at summer camp, when an abrupt awareness frightened me. What if nothing existed? What if nothing ever existed? Not just no planets, no plants, no people, but no anything, no matter, no energy, no space, no time. Nothing forever. Why does anything at all exist? My whole life I've wondered. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth, all Closer to Truth, reflects this wonder. I confront my obsession by exploring nothing. Why is there something rather than nothing? What is nothing? Philosophers and scientists offer their views. I immerse myself in nothing. Richard, when we think of why there is anything, there is nothing more astonishing, nothing, than there is something, that nothing would have been the most logical possibility. I share that intuition. It is extremely puzzling. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Well, all explanation consists in trying to find something simple and ultimate from which every, on it, which everything else depends. It's very strange that we think of nothing as the sort of default, um, because we're not familiar with it. We've never lived in a world in which there's nothing. You have discovered the presupposition that makes the question of why is there anything at all uh, so vexing, because nothing does seem simpler than anything else. What would count as an answer to the question? Of course, we can't describe in a way the non-existent things interacting with, the other, with each other to produce existent things. We'd have to have some other sort of answer if it had an answer at all. That is just the kind of question that uh, we will be stuck with when we have a final theory. No matter how mathematically consistent and logically consistent the theory is, there will always be the alternative that, well, perhaps an alter there's nothing at all. Not even empty space, but just absolutely nothing. Closer to truth, at its core, is my quest to understand this ultimate question. Why is there something rather than nothing? I sought the philosopher John Leslie, who for decades had been asking, why is there a universe, not a blank? I've devoted all my career to trying to look into this question. I think there's uh, two general sorts of questions which science can never answer, and one is them is why there are any laws at all running the world, and the other is why there's any world rather than a blank. I think our belief that life is worth living could be influenced by the answers which we bring to these questions. John and I met in 2006, and our conversations are featured in many Closer to Truth episodes. Soon thereafter, we decided to co-edit a book on the ultimate question. It's called The Mystery of Existence. Why is there anything at all? A prime issue is whether the concept of nothing even makes sense. Many people now would say that the question, why isn't there nothing, is a meaningless question. One thing they might be saying is that there's some sort of contradiction in the idea of uh, there being nothing. If you're talking about the possible absence of everything, you have no truth maker to make it true that it's possible that everything be absent. But they have the slogan, this is very popular among philosophers these days, that truths always require truth makers, and truth makers must be in the end existing things. So that if you want to talk about the truth of a law of physics, for example, you have to have actual particles going around and obeying the law of physics, otherwise you're not talking about anything. Maybe there's a language confusion that's built into the question. So when I'm worrying about why not nothing, uh, I am 
worrying about a meaningless question. Surely there's no contradiction in a blank because in a blank there's nothing to contradict itself. Mm-hmm. And the other person says, well, yes, there's a contradiction here because you're supposing that it could be really the case that there was a blank, but reality always involves things. Or the person would say, there's a contradiction here because God has to exist. Mm. And you're supposing the contradictory situation of God being possible, but God not existing. When you hit these counter-arguments, you ask for more details. You say, well, where is the contradiction in God not existing? And suppose that the answer comes to you, oh, well, we don't know enough about that. We're too humble to know this. It's too much of a mystery, but um, it's essential to our faith and so on. And that ends the conversation. Tends to. My philosophy is a, a very difficult and frustrating field, and I wish I'd been a novelist instead. <laughs> <laughs> nothing is not meaningless. There could have been nothing. I feel this deeply, but feelings betray. So why not nothing? I need a clear understanding of nothing. I asked philosopher Peter Van Inwagen. Peter, if there were nothing, what would there be? To say that there's nothing is to say that there isn't anything. And that's all there is to it. Maybe you could allow the existence of abstract things if you believe in them like numbers uh, or mathematical objects like that. Maybe the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is the question, why are there concrete things? Or, Or maybe not. A vast emptiness is a vast emptiness. For there to be nothing, if there were really nothing, um, there wouldn't be points in space that were a certain distance apart, even a vacuum. If there's really nothing, there isn't even a big vacuum. It's just there isn't anything. For anything that you might mention, there isn't that. If you ask, why is there anything? Well, you can't appeal to anything in addition to anything because there isn't anything in addition to anything. That's what makes it such a difficult question. That's what makes it a non-ordinary question. So is absolute nothing, literally nothing, even possible? I asked philosopher Timothy O'Connor. Suppose it is possible that there is nothing. And imagine that that possibility were so. Of course, we wouldn't inhabit that possibility. Nothing would. So had there been nothing, then it would have been possible, since nothingness is not necessary, which we know because there is something. So we we have an existence proof that shows us that nothingness is not necessary. So if there had been nothing, but still it were possible that there be something, there would be no ground for that alleged possibility of something. Even if there were absolute nothing, there would at least have to still be possibilities. You can't get around that, no matter what. You can't get around that, right. So there's at least this possible truth, some proposition, some fact, some, some feature of reality. But that's not absolute nothingness. It's a very empty reality, just these pure possibilities of something. I find the idea of absolute nothingness a problematic idea. When dealing with nothing, Can any explanation make sense? I ask Oxford philosopher of religion, Richard Swinburne. I think we can answer the question, why is there a physical universe? And I think the answer is in terms of God having made it and sustained it. But the question, why is there anything, would include the question, why is there a God? And... um, I don't think we can answer that. Indeed, I don't think it has an answer because inevitably you can explain X by Y and Y by Z and Z by A and so on, but uh, this this is going to come to a stop somewhere. The only questions we can answer is why there is a physical universe and we ought to postulate the simplest explanation which leads us to expect the phenomena. And I think that the existence of God is that. The God answer is a popular one. Not that popularity means truth, of course. How might the existence of God deal with the possibility of nothingness? 
I ask Father Robert Spitzer, a Jesuit priest and philosopher. Nothing does seem simpler than anything else, except for perhaps absolute simplicity. And, and you but know, that's nothing. Uh, well, no, <laughs> I would maintain absolute simplicity as power without a intrinsic or extrinsic restriction. Wow, that sounded very <clears throat> a lot of somethings. Yeah, well, actually, it's not a, a lot. lot of somethings. I, I would just say simply this: I would say, why assume that nothing is the uh, condition uh, that demarcates, uh, as it were, the eternal existence of everything? All right. Let's suppose for just a moment that there was something like absolute simplicity. What gives us the problem is really finite realities because finite realities then imply something beyond that finitude. If you really have an unrestricted reality, which is not a lot of some things, it's a perfect unity, then perhaps perfect unitive reality, something which exists through itself, is the primordial and that nothing, nothing is only the result of our reflecting on what's outside of the boundaries of finite reality. It would seem to me if I, was, if I were given a choice between nothing being the most simple and an unrestricted, unbounded, simplistic reality mm -hmm. being the, the, the primordial existent, mm -hmm. I would pick nothing. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can see why you'd do it, because of course you'd think, well, there's no presuppositions in nothing. But what I would want to suggest is, there are no presuppositions in perfect simplicity, a perfect unitive, unrestricted power either. If you really did have something that was truly absolutely simple, had no intrinsic or extrinsic boundaries whatsoever, which was a completely unconditioned reality, there wouldn't be a single presupposition that attached itself to that reality. Wouldn't I ask, why does that exist? Actually, you, you wouldn't have to because it would exist through itself. No, I mean, that's, now, that's an answer to the question, but uh, yeah. I still have to ask the question. Yeah, you... you uh, I mean, if it's nothing, I don't have to ask a question. Yeah, but actually, to be honest with you, if you understood it in itself, yes. you would understand that it was presuppositionless and therefore that you wouldn't have to ask the question. The problem is a limitation to our understanding. Some physicists claim to have answered the question naturally, without God or anything supernatural. Quantum physics, they say, can explain why is there something rather than nothing. That the debate becomes impassioned highlights the probing authority of the question. I meet physicist and atheist Victor Stenger. Well, the uh, answer is that the universe is nothing. It's kind of a crystallized nothing. What we have now is, is a phase transition that went from nothing to something, like from water to ice. You go from a state of uh, higher symmetry to a state of of lower symmetry, of, of one with more structure. And, and uh, in physics, in nature, uh, that tends to be the way things go. The, the more symmetric state is actually the less stable state. And so they tend to go through this transformation to something more structured. That happens to be the lower energy arrangement of the molecule. So let's just imagine what I call the void. Uh, it's a region of space where you've removed all the particles, all the energy, and so you have no particles at present. You have no particular direction in space uh, selected out, no particular orientation in space. In other words, uh, it's a very symmetric situation, and nothing is more symmetric than nothing. And so that's a situation that's going to actually be unstable. So if there ever were such a situation, then the chances are good that it will actually uh, transform by, by natural processes to, to a less symmetric state where then you have, you have structure that you didn't have before. But Victor, the laws of physics, quantum physics are not nothing. How to explore further plumb the depths of the question, why is there something rather than nothing? 
I cannot get this question out of my head. I speak with Oxford philosopher John Hawthorne. John, on occasion at night, I'll wake up in a cold sweat thinking that there could have been nothing. Why is there something? There were a few questions buried in there a bit. I mean, one question is, could there have been nothing? Mm -hmm. And we can answer that. And there's a yes or an, and a no. And then whichever way we go, we could try the question, what, well, why is there um, something? Or why is there not nothing? So but let's go up the chain on that, though. So we can say coherently that there could have been a total world without any particles. That's easy. That's right. Yeah, that's easy. Okay. Right? Could there have been no forces? I think it, I would feel that, yes, there could have been no forces. Excellent. Okay. And then you go up to, could there have been no space and time? And it's a little harder. That's harder. I mean, maybe we could roll it into space time. Oh, fine, yeah. fine. So, so could there have been none of that? I mean, it certainly seems so. Okay. I mean, uh, okay. All right. Uh, I mean, you feel that the, the burdens on the people who say that there has to be space time. Space time. Okay. All right. I'm with you there. The next step is abstract objects, which are numbers, which are the easiest one. Well, truths. Take the, the truth that there's either nothing or something. Right. Right. Uh, could that, there have not been the that, truth right, that there's right, nothing? Right. At? And right. so, uh, you know, so if you think there are things like truths or propositions, then it's quite natural to think that they Had have truths. to exist. So you might think, well, there could have been maybe nothing concrete, but even if there had been nothing concrete, there would have been the truth that there's nothing concrete, right. and so there would have been something. I don't know whether that will help you go back to sleep at night. You know? <laughs> but you might say also, I'd surprise you to know there, is a small, there are a small minority of philosophers that think everything exists necessarily, that you, even you and this table couldn't have not existed. It, 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 even giving, given the, the, the constraints of evolution and contingency upon contingency? Yes, yeah, so you could have not been concrete. You could have been like an abstract marble, and oh. that's their picture. Oh. The picture is roughly necessarily everything exists necessarily. And yet, and that some things exist concretely because they're picked out of that universe. That, yes, that, that, yes, yeah. so it's not like you're concrete necessarily, but it's just the way that you are that changes, but not, not whether, whether you are. Okay, how do possibilities work? That it was always possible that there could have been a universe, even if there were none. A question always is whether these are arguments for the existence of objects. I mean, so-called nominalists in mathematics will agree that one and one's two, right. but will say that doesn't require that objects exist. That, that, Similarly, there's a kind of guy that says, oh, necessarily it was possible that there's something, but that doesn't mean that there's this thing, a possibility that exists. Right, right. So how, 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 do you, how are you on, on existence of possibilities? Are they th things that are real? And the sort of person that likes truths and falsehoods existing. Uh -huh. It's possible that there are, are winged pigs. And that seems like a claim, the sort of thing that's true and false. And that's an existing thing? Yeah. The claim. Yeah. The claim is, is an the existing. The claim that seems quite natural and intuitive to me to think that insofar as you're going to believe that there, there are claims, uh, then you should think that they exist necessarily, yeah. I think that's the default picture of a lot of philosophers. God can, uh, as it were, erase the concrete, but can't erase the whole shebang. If it is impossible to get rid of possibilities, claims, truths, then it is impossible to have absolutely nothing. But whatever would constitute maximum nothing Back to my original question, why is there something? I asked philosopher Peter Forrest. I think there's only one sort of answer to that, and it's a bit of a cheat, that why is there something rather than nothing? Because there's something that's necessary, and then there is some explanation as to how you get the things that aren't necessary from the thing that is necessary necessary because in order to really understand why there is something rather than nothing, it would have to be necessary in the sense of being incomprehensible that it could have been otherwise. The two 
rival explanations right. is going to be the naturalistic idea that we just have these necessary laws right. that bring everything into existence on the one hand, or that we have God who as an agent brings things into existence. But neither of these are necessary in the sense required to f understand why there is something rather than nothing. So it's a bit of a fudge. What we can say is there are certain things that are necessary in some slightly different sense. And both God or the laws of nature could be candidates for those. How so? Well, I'll try to explain in the case of God. If there are abstract objects, including possible universes, ways the universe might be, then these things themselves are necessary beings. So these possibilities, including, as it were, blueprints for all possible universes. Now, the thing is this, that these kind of blueprints are necessary beings. Our universe isn't a necessary being, but the possibility of our universe like ours is a necessary being. But because we cannot imagine in any possible way that such a possibility doesn't exist. The actuality doesn't have to exist, but the possibility has to exist. That's the idea. Okay. Now, the possibilities by themselves won't explain why there is anything actual. But what a theist will do is to say, well, you don't need much in addition to these possibilities. All you require is some act, a choice among possibilities. Now, that choice is contingent. So the ultimate explanation for things is the range of pre-existing necessary possibilities and this one simple act, the choice. Mm. So, although we haven't explained why there's something rather than nothing, we've explained why there are things in terms of one ultimate mystery, this act, this choice. But the difference is that the, the physical laws, if you take them to be the ultimate things, are only going to be comparatively simple. They're not going to be absolutely simple. Whereas a sort of act, it is because it's good, that kind of choice, has in it a kind of simplicity which I would claim the laws couldn't have. And I think that's one of the advantages of ultimate explanation in terms of agency over ultimate explanation in terms of laws. So I don't think we can explain why there's something rather than nothing. But I think the best we can do is to explain it relative to taking as unexplained and mysterious, a simple fact of a choice, given that there is this pre-existing domain of possibilities. That's the theistic account. Why is there something rather than nothing? What is nothing? No thing. But there are different kinds or levels of nothing. Why levels of nothing? That's where the confusion lies. I have nine levels of nothing, from simple nothing to absolute nothing, each nothing having less and less. By nothing five, there is no matter, no energy, no space, no time. But there are the laws of physics. Nothing six, no laws of physics. Nothing seven, no God, no consciousness. Nothing eight, no abstract objects. This means no numbers, no logic, no truths, no platonic forms. Nothing nine, no possibilities. Nothings one through seven remove existing things so that a nothing I might call real nothing would be nothing seven, which has no concrete things, not even God. But some argue that God is necessary, meaning that it is impossible for God not to exist, thus crowning nothing six, which includes God as the ultimate limit. 
As for the nothing of physicists, nothing five, where the laws of physics generate new universes from nothing, well, the laws of physics are not absolute nothing. The nothing of physicists is thick with fields and forces, barely halfway to absolute nothing. So now, how to explain the mystery of existence? Why is there anything at all? That's next on Closer to Truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.